Welcome to Ignite Me Now. I'm your host, Melissa Mackey, aka Melissa the Motivator. I am a mom to patients, Grace. I am an author, a speaker, and most of all, I am a mompreneur. I am on a mission. In fact, I'm a single mama on a mission to inspire moms all around the globe to tap into their potential, live their best life, and most of all, make money doing the things they love. You are going to learn tactical, practical, and applicable things to your business so that you can grow, scale, or start your business. You are also going to hear inspiring interviews from thought leaders all around the globe. So buckle up. If you love what you hear, make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Okay, you guys. So we have a really special guest, and today he is blessing us with his presence all the way from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. This is Theo Fleury. He is perhaps best known for his time on the ice, but off the rink, his life once carried the markings of a troubled childhood, abuse, and coping with emotional pain through addictive and self-destructive behaviors. Today, Theo defines himself as a victor over trauma, over addiction, and a facilitator to those still trying to find their way. His best-selling books, Playing With Fire and Conversations with a Rattlesnake, encourage open sharing and provide practical tools that people seeking help can personally use. These tools are also useful to those who want to lead a productive conversation called Real Conversations with anybody else experiencing trauma. Today, Theo is a healthy, motivational, and successful agent of change. He is committed to daily transformation through personal growth, mindfulness, and new action. And his compassionate spirit allows others to feel safe and whole by experiencing his uh, reliability. Reliability. There you go. So you guys, here we are. Theo, welcome. Welcome to the show, the summit, Faith Over Fear Mm -hmm. Summit. I want to make sure that we can see both of us side by side on this space. Speaker view. Okay, perfect. Uh, Is your computer, um, are you by a window? Yeah. Are you facing the window? Yeah. Oh, weird. (laughs) Because I was asking to see if there was more light. Uh, I tried to do the best I could with the light down here, but it's not cooperating with me. So Okay, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Today, this whole summit, there's been so many glitches and ups and downs, and it doesn't even matter because all we we are here doing is just being real. And we got to yeah. like grow with the flow. So <laughs> exactly. welcome. So how about you share, like share, share with the audience who you are, like what, and, and I mean, the reason for me reaching out to you is because I met you, gosh, it, it had to have been over five years ago because I didn't have my baby yet. And I saw you speak and you had some meet and greet thing after. And I was just so moved and touched by your story. And so with me running this Faith Over Fear Summit, it's like, who can I reach out to that perhaps has a powerful story where I believe there was like little nuggets of faith that you had to believe in something bigger than yourself to help right. you get through that moment in time. And then, yeah, share, share, share. Jeez. <laughs> I don't know if we have enough time, but, uh, you know, I have a pretty extensive trauma history. Um, you know, my, my parents both experienced childhood trauma in their life and that manifested itself into addictions so my dad was an alcoholic. My mom was a prescription pill addict. And so I grew up in chaos and violence and, you know, insanity. Mm-hmm. And then uh, it wasn't too long after that I discovered hockey, which became my happy place. And, and I was really good at it, really good at hockey. And so I run into this guy along my travels as a 12-year-old who basically promised me a one-way ticket to the NHL if I followed his formula. And what happened over a a two-and-a-half-year period from 14 to 16-and-a-half, this guy raped me 150 times. 
And so what I was left with was a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment. And there wasn't one person in the world that I could have told. Because if I told, first of all, I wouldn't be believed. And then secondly, I would have been blackballed and, you know, my dream and my happy place would have been taken away from me. Yeah. So I kept this secret inside for, you know, about 30 years. And I discovered alcohol very early on in that process, which then developed into my own addiction issues and my own problems and all of that. And, uh, and what happened was I got kicked out of the NHL because I could no longer manage the emotional pain that was left behind from my experiences as a child. And 16 years ago, I had a fully loaded pistol in my mouth ready to pull the trigger and end my life. Not because I wanted to die, but I was completely exhausted from living in emotional pain and suffering for the majority of my life. I've tried, I tried everything on the planet to get rid of this um, feeling. Mm -hmm. And because I couldn't pull the trigger and end my life, I was like, holy cow, well, I better figure this out so that I could have a happy, healthy, peaceful, productive life. And about, 14 and a half years ago, I hit my knees in a washroom and I had it out with the big guy upstairs. Are you referring to God? I'm referring to whatever you want to call it. Allah, Buddha, Jehovah, God, yeah. a tree in your backyard, your baby finger, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> and so after that incident in the washroom, I went to bed and I woke up the next day and I haven't had a drink or a drug since that day. Okay. And so, um, I sat down and wrote a book about my experience. And what happened was I got completely run over by people who had had the same experience as me. And so I said to myself, wow, by me finding my own voice and telling my own story, it has helped other people find their voice and talk about what happened. And so basically for the last 11 years, I've been traveling all over North America, talking about my story, but more importantly, creating a safe space for people to talk about what happened to them. And that's basically it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. um, is faith a part of it? There's absolutely no question. There has always been a plan for my life. And when I surrendered, the plan was basically shown to me as to what the rest of my life was going to look like. Mm-hmm. It looks like we have lost him just in the moment that he stopped sharing his story and said, this is it in a nutshell. Uh, hopefully he will <clears throat> get back on. But what power <clears throat> and vulnerability is it to get to that place that is feeling at peace with what has occurred in our life. And you guys, this is the power that lies within your story and the ability it has to, to be able to share your story with the world. And you are giving, by you sharing your story with the world, you are giving others permission to share their story. And the more that we can become real and the more that we can share the truth of our story 
is the moment that everything begins to shift because so many people are holding on to their story inside their soul for fear of what could happen on the other side, just like Theo was sharing that his, uh, his, he, he was scared from 14 to 16 because he couldn't tell anybody. And so it's really powerful to hear other people's stories because that really gives us the permission. That really gives them the permission to share their story. Just getting messages. He's back. Um, and so in, in all of this, like, where did you, where did you find that strength? And, you know, something that we had chatted about on the phone was this idea of team or community. Yeah. Yeah. And basically all I've done is I've built a team of people that can help me on a daily basis, you know, just stay on the straight and narrow and stay focused, stay motivated, stay inspired, uh, provide hope for other people. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the one relationship that I completely and totally avoided was the one that I had with myself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, when I, and, and that's really in a nutshell, what the healing process is, is, you know, physically, emotionally, and spiritually is the journey yeah. and heal, healing all three of those parts, which means essentially is having a relationship with myself. Cause I always wondered why, <clears throat> you know, relationships didn't work for me. Well, I wasn't having a relationship with myself. So how could I possibly have a relationship with anybody else? Yeah. And it wasn't until I started healing those three parts that relationships in my life, you know, got better. And I was attracted to, you know, the right people mm -hmm. that, that could help me. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's not rocket science. It's pretty basic stuff. Yeah. But, but if, if, if that's a problem, common sense, isn't that common these days? Right. It isn't, but. Um, you know, for me, it's all about vulnerability in the healing process. Mm -hmm. And when we're vulnerable, it creates safety. Yeah. And then when you have safety. That's when the magic of healing happens is when people feel safe. And if you can make somebody feel safe by listening then, you know, you can, because nine times out of 10, when people come up to me at events and I'm the person that they're telling their story to for the very first time, like, I don't have to say anything. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is be present, be attuned and listen. And I watch people get rid of shame in a, like a five or 10 minute meeting. Yeah. You know, and that's what gets me out of bed every day is those opportunities to, you know, be that person that can help somebody else heal. Mm -hmm. well, what really happens is, you know, there I get more from them than I could possibly give to them. Yeah. Because helping is healing. Oh, I love that. And people, who are, and people who are stuck, you know, I always tell them, go help somebody else. Because that gets you out of your head. Mm -hmm. Right? And, I, and for me, this whole uh, coronavirus thing has been really hard for me. Mm -hmm. From severe depression, anxiety, panic all this stuff. And so, you know, I need relationship in my life as much as possible. And so, you know, that has been very difficult in this situation. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's caused me to even look deeper, you know, peel 
couple more layers off the onion, you know, with my own, my own stuff. Yep. So. Yeah. And I think it's, I mean, obviously this conversation can go on for hours because it's, it's deep and this is, this honestly is what I believe is what human beings on the planet are, are craving so deeply for it's, it's connection. And I know it really sucks that all of us are stuck inside right now, but there's something to be said about those individuals, those entrepreneurs, those coaches, trainers, you know, healers, including yourself who are out there in the world choosing to want to make a difference by helping other people and getting out of their own way. Obviously, we all know that a lot of stuff in the world right now is so flipping easy. You know, an overweight person knows darn well that they need to lose weight. Well, it's pretty simple. Start watching the food that you're putting in your mouth. Well, if it's that simple, why aren't pe more people doing it? Right. And something else that you said was uh, in the healing process, it's so important to have community um, for connection for helping you get through those really troubled times in your life. But I know as a mom myself, I have a little four year old. And like my number one goal with her is to create a space of safety. And it's like this emotional safety, I believe is the foundation of everything that we do. And you even said it. I talked about it this morning on the summit uh, when we started things off is that everything starts with yourself. It's personal. Yep. And that relationship that you have with yourself oftentimes is formed in the first like, you know, six to 12 years of our life. And if yep. it's been formed in a foundation that is not feeling safe, obviously we still have work to do in the yeah. future there there's no question and you know i look at my own story you know i didn't feel safe you mm -hmm. know and you know i'm not blaming anybody because yeah. i always say we're doing the best we can with what we have yeah and if we do better we would do better right mm -hmm. so um so yeah i i, I live a very fear-based life right and it's finding avenues. Um, but, you know, it all comes back to the basics of what I know. And that's, you know, I was part of a team for the first 40 years of my life. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, it's all about recreating that now that I no longer have that. Right. I got to create that. So I always tell people, you know, find your five, find five people that you can be vulnerable with where they're not going to judge you. They're not going to take the information, use it against you, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And check in with those people at least once a day. Whether you're feeling great, shitty, whatever it is, mm -hmm. reach out and have that conversation because the hardest thing for me and the reason why I was a chronic relapser was when I was in relapse mode, guess what? I didn't pick up the phone so that somebody could talk me out of the relapse. And the next thing you know, here I am pounding on a, you know, sitting on a bar stool, pounding on the thing and going, how did this happen again? Mm -hmm. Well, it was because I didn't reach out. Yeah. And, you know, a five minute phone call could change your chemistry exponentially. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we're getting, we're getting that hit of oxytocin, right? Yeah. And the oxytocin is the drug of love and connection. Instead of going into cortisol and, you know, all of these awful chemicals that we produce when we're in stress, you know, if we sit in that stuff, you know, 
it causes us more harm. Mm -hmm. So that's why relationship is so important. What, you know, cortisol is our stress response. And the only thing that sucks that cortisol up is oxytocin, which is relationship. Mm -hmm. So if we isolate and we don't reach out, that cortisol takes over our body and becomes panic disorder, depression, all of these things. And so it's incredibly important when we're falling down that rabbit hole is, you know, we seek relationship mm -hmm. or movement, right? Walking, exercising, walk the dog, whatever it is, movement will get you out of that, that uh, cycle. Mm -hmm. which isn't easy to do. Let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like if you look back on your life, you said 14 years ago is when you started kind of sharing your story. <clears throat> like wh what was it inside of you? Because prior to that, clearly you didn't give a shit about who you were. You know, you felt worthless. You felt ashamed. You felt all these crappy emotions. And, and I know in your story, you said, you had a fight and you got down on your knees that one night. Um, but what was it like? What was that turning point where you were like, okay, enough is enough. Well, I knew I was going to die. Okay. And I didn't want to die. Yeah. And, you know, I had to change absolutely every single thing about my life. Everything mm -hmm. from top to bottom, friends, family, you know, you name it, job, everything. I had to change everything. Yeah. Because if I didn't, you know, I, I once had a coach who said, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Yeah. You know, and, but it's also scary at the same time. But, you know, my will to live was more than I wanted to stay the same. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and yeah, like, um, I remember somebody telling me, you want to find out who your real friends are, get sober. Okay. Yeah. So I got sober. I had 500 phone numbers in my phone who were people that I drank with. I did drugs with my drug dealer, you know, all these things. And so, you know what I did? I called all 500 numbers. Mm-hmm. Listen, I made a choice. I made a decision, not drinking, not doing drugs, not going to bars. So don't ask me to do that. But I said, if you'd like to come to my house, I'll cook you a nice dinner. First time in our relationship, we'll actually have a meaningful conversation. You know how many friends I had left? Two, two of 500. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's all I needed because my two friends loved me, cared about me want to see me drinking and doing all that and that's how I built you know started to rebuild my life was I realized that you know I don't need 500 friends yes you know I need relationship I need people in my life that can help me rebuild my life and but you know, like I said, the one thing that I neglected was myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, through therapy and spirituality and, you know, all that stuff, right? I, 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 I took a look at myself mm -hmm. and, you know, realized I wasn't as bad as I thought I was, you know, and from that grew self-love and self-care and, and, and all those things that are really important, the things that we neglect when we're trauma survivors, right? Because mm -hmm. I think the world has a whole lot of, I'm not good enough. That, yeah. that, that's what the world uh, is right now. And the only way you're going to feel good enough is if you have that relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I am spiritually connected, guess what? I'm never alone. What a concept, right? You know? <laughs> it's rocket science. 
you know, you know, prayer and meditation and breathing exercises and exercise and all those, all those things will help you rebuild that, you know, that confident self mm -hmm. that you, uh, you know, live the rest of your life. And, and it's not going to happen overnight. You know, yeah. I always tell people, you know, I'm in therapy for the rest of my life mm -hmm. and I'm completely okay with that. Right. Because mm -hmm. there is no magic pill. Okay. There's no magic pill. Cause I've tried them all. And the only thing that works is me looking at myself in the mirror and going, do I like what's staring back at me? That's the best pill. Mm -hmm. But it takes hard work, you know, yeah. and day, every day is not going to be, you know, rainbows, unicorns and pixie dust. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's ups and downs, but you don't want those ups and downs to be like mine where they were, you know, Mount Everest at the highest and then hell, which is the lowest. Mm -hmm. It's kind of want to go along like this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're, we're going to continue to have ups and downs, but yeah. yeah, you just want them to be like super high or super low. You just kind of want somewhere in the middle. Mm hmm. And I just love this conversation that we're having because uh, for all of you who are listening right now, uh, I see Teresa typed in the comments, quality over quantity. And this is exactly what we ch chatted about this morning. It is quality over quantity. I remember being that bar star and, you know, out every night and you were the cool person if you had all the crowd around you and, you know, everyone's doing shots. And that is a lifestyle that served its purpose for me while it did, and clearly for yourself. But when you remove yourself from that way of being, it's freaking hard. You run through stuff like, I'm not good enough. I'm a loser. I have no friends, you know, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And so I can see the value in having just those five people that you can just say, hey, this is how I'm feeling today. I just need to get this off my chest. And uh, somebody here in the comments, you said, um, who was this? Jane, you said, I am not good enough is like a pandemic. Isn't that it the is. truth? It is. Mm -hmm. It is. But it's also what trauma teaches us. Yeah. Right? So there, when I was writing my second book, Conversations with a Rattlesnake, I wrote it with a neuroscientist. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you know, we discovered four things about what trauma teaches us. Okay. So the first thing is abandonment and neglect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second, I'm not good enough. Third, I'm not lovable. And then the fourth is, do I even exist in the world? Mm -hmm. And when I discovered those four things were sort of what I believed about myself. And uh, Kim, who I wrote the book with, bas basically telling me I can rewire my brain. Well, those were the four things that I needed to rewire in my brain. Yeah. Right. Is, you know, th that abandonment stuff, like, for me was huge in relationship. Mm -hmm. Somebody got mad at me or whatever. I just automatically went to that person's going to leave me. Yeah. And then not good enough. Holy cow. Like anybody watched my NHL career, like I would build it right to the top, tear it all down, build yep. it back, tear it all down because I never thought I was good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, lovable. Hmm. Jeez. I didn't love myself. So how could I be lovable? Mm -hmm. You know, and then, you know, the fourth one is, you know, we have an opioid epidemic on the planet. Well, that's why people gravitate towards because they grew up in foster homes. They were abandoned, neglected, abused physically, emotionally, spiritually. Right. So, yep. you know, where do, where do I belong? So the pharmaceutical company creates this drug called Oxycontin and 
because we're 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 so wired to want to have oxytocin. Yep. Right. So they created synthetic oxytocin. And when people ingest or take this oxycotton, which is a synthetic version, you know, it gives you those warm and fuzzy feelings. So why do you think people get addicted to this stuff? Because it creates relationship, Mm -hmm. you know, so. Well, and that's, that's what I've heard before is what is the opposite of addiction? It's connection. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And when you're completely disconnected, you know, I hate the word addiction. I hate it because mm-hmm. there's shame attached to it. Right. Yeah. So I've changed. It's called emotional pain management. And that's what it is. Mm-hmm. We are managing our emotional pain and suffering. Yep. So true. So for coping I, mechanism. I, yeah, it's it's definitely a coping mechanism. And I think many people on the planet, we know, we all know at least one person. Maybe it's ourself, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's you know, a coach, a a colleague. We all know someone who is struggling with some sort of trauma. I mean, really, we could put this COVID-19 thing into the bucket of trauma. Well, it's it's the most traumatic thing that's happened since World War II. Yeah. So yeah. we've all experienced some sort of trauma at some point in our life. And so I know we're getting uh, over time right now because I have my next uh, speaker ready in the waiting room. But what can you leave the audience with? Um when it comes to the idea of having the confidence to share their story, because I know many people on this summit are entrepreneurs or they have an idea that they want to be an entrepreneur. And we all know that our story is part of the reason why we want to be an entrepreneur. And so what kind of advice can you give somebody that maybe has not shared their vulnerability in in their story with the world how you know like what 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 could you offer them mm. well i've i've lots of thoughts cuz it's a really loaded question i know right? um so the day i asked for help was the day that i saved my own life so don't be afraid to ask for help Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, those of us who've experienced trauma, guess what? We're the healers on the planet. Okay. And being an entrepreneur, you're trying to solve a problem. Being a coach, you're trying to help somebody. And so if you don't have vulnerability, if you can't share your story, how are you going to connect with, to the person you're working with? And, and so that vulnerability piece is going to create the safety where you can build the relationship between you and the person that you're working with. And that, that ultimately will empower them inspire them to you know get to where they want to go right Mm -hmm. and 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 you know it's okay like i always say to people like if you if you suffer from mental illness guess what you're in the majority you're not in the minority Mm -hmm. majority you know like every mental health campaign has one in four or one in five. And I'm like, that's such bullshit. Why are we singling out and shaming the one person who has mental health? Mm-hmm. It's five and five. It's all of us. Cause if we don't have it, we know somebody who has it. Yeah. Totally. Right. And so team, 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 team. 
Mm-hmm. Build, Go team! <laughs> you know, build your own team. Yeah. Build your own team. And it doesn't have to be 5,000 teammates. Mm-hmm. You know, five. Five is good enough. Three is good enough. Two is good enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I love this. I just love this. This is, it just ties everything that we talked about this morning, just packages it so nicely with a, a little bow. And I don't know if you have this yet, but I know that you're launching um, a trauma program. Do you have like a link that people could at least sign up t- so they can learn you- what that's about? Well, I just found out that I probably won't be speaking for another 18 months. So, <laughs> so I'm putting this together. I'm actually recording the videos on Wednesday and Thursday and then putting it all in a package. So I will make sure okay. that uh, when I have the link, when it's all live and ready to go, that yeah. uh, that'll be a- available. And basically what it is, is I'm trying to build a team of people on the internet that is a safe space where we can help each other solve problems and issues. Right. And we do it together. Mm -hmm. Amazing type. What is your number one fear that really is holding you back? Is it fear of failure, fear of success? Like what is that fear? Because I tell you, You could transform that fear and allow it to fuel you into your faith to build that strong foundation to catapult from that place of peace and that personal place of power. So without further ado, I am so excited to be bringing on Theo Flurry. Okay, that's amazing. I just want to say thank you for saying yes and showing up asking me thanks to everybody for listening um i will go on the facebook page and i'll i'll answer some questions for the people that didn't get the answers to their questions on this live hit so yeah yeah there's there's lots okay cool awesome thank you okay bye bye